While Britain and the Commonwealth mourn the death of Queen Elizabeth last week, the potentially seismic shift of a new king is also underway. Let's explore that with Philippe Lagasse, Associate Professor of International Affairs at Carleton University and an expert on the Crown. He joins us from our nation's capital. And here in our studio, Delia Opikokyu, writer and lawyer who was the first Indigenous woman called to the bar in Ontario and royal historian and author Carolyn Harris. And we're delighted to have you three with us, uh, both here in the studio and Philippe in our nation's capital. And that's where we're going to start today. Philippe, maybe you could tell us what kind of plan did the Canadian government have in place for how it would deal with the passing of the Queen? Because we know they obviously had a plan in place. Yes, uh, Steve, uh, you'll see uh, there's a, a manual that dates from the 1960s, uh, the Manual on Official Procedure and Practice, that laid out a lot of this. So the plans have been in place for some time. Uh, th what the current government did, though, was a slight variation on that to keep it updated with the time. So, for instance, uh, uh, not all members of the Privy Council were called together, it was kept to the cabinet. We're still not quite clear on what the morning will involve in Canada. So there was a plan. It's not exactly the one that we have public access to, but it follows more or less what we saw. And I'll just note that there was one area that was a little bit different, uh, w which was the proclamations that were done in the provinces. And when there's a change in the established plan, who ultimately decides how those changes are going to come forward? So ultimately, this is something that belongs with the Prime Minister, and it's done uh, in consultation with uh, officials in, within the Privy Council office, uh, no, notably the Secretary to the Queen, I would imagine, and they come up with what they believe is the appropriate response. And if you look at that uh, manual from the 1960s, you'll see that it's, it's actually quite adamant that a lot of these decisions are discretionary, and they ultimately rest with the Prime Minister. Gotcha. Carolyn, let me follow up with you in as much as... Uh, when the plan maybe changes a little bit, mm -hmm. as you look, is there anything sort of unexpected or distinctive or unusual that you've seen over the last few days that you hadn't anticipated? Well, something that very much stands out in 2022 compared to 1952 is the involvement of the Governor General, uh, Mary Simon, as 70 years ago, when King George VI passed away on the 6th of February, 1952, um, Canada's Governor General, the last British born Governor General, Viscount Alexander, had been summoned back to the United Kingdom to be Prime Minister Winston Churchill's defense minister. But the first Canadian born Governor General, Vincent Massey, had not yet taken office, and he wouldn't until the 19th of February. So it was the administrator in Canada who made the proclamation of the new Queen, Elizabeth II. Whereas it's different in 2022, we have Governor General Mary Simon, and she first met the Queen over a video conferencing and then was there for the Platinum Jubilee, so already had this working relationship uh, with the Queen. Something else that stands out in 2022 is the very emotional speech by the Prime Minister as he's known the Queen since he was a child, as his father, uh, Pierre Elliott Trudeau, was also Prime Minister. And so he was able to speak of this very lifelong connection mm -hmm. to the Queen and to the monarchy. So there's been some very, very touching speeches by, the, by those who've known the Queen over the course of her reign. And let me bring it down to the province of Ontario, because uh, many people mm -hmm. would have seen yesterday that Lieutenant Governor Elizabeth Dowdswell, mm -hmm. the royal representative mm -hmm. here in the province of Ontario, and Premier Ford held mm -hmm. a ceremony. Mm -hmm. Would that have happened in 1952 with then Premier Leslie Frost and whoever the GG of the day was? Now that would or not, LG, I should, I should say. <laughs> now that would not have been the case in 1952. We're seeing this extended um, involvement uh, by the provinces in terms of the royal proclamation. Certainly, uh, the, the Queen was uh, proclaimed uh, in uh, Ontario, but the degree to which that we're seeing the provinces and their involvement in these ceremonies, that very much stands out. Gotcha. Delia, uh, we obviously wanted you here today because we want a better understanding of how uh, people in the Indigenous world are reacting to the Queen's death. What does it mean to you and your colleagues? Uh, what it means to me uh, and my colleagues is that uh, uh, there is an emotional feeling about Queen Elizabeth passing. Uh, she was uh, honoured many times by Indigenous people, and she represents the uh, 
uh, the Crown in respect of the signing of the treaties, because uh, e each of the treaties were signed on behalf of whatever the Majesty was uh, in place at the time. And so the leading words for the treaties is the uh, is, is the particular uh, the particular name, like for instance Queen Victoria or, or Prince Edward, mm -hmm. uh, with a number of treaties in the uh, 19 and. Uh, 19th century and the 20th centuries. And so, especially the elders take the personally the fact that they consider the crown, uh, the, the human being themselves being responsible for enforcing the treaties. The younger people had diff do have different feelings. Many of them uh, look at the colonialism as being a bad thing, of course, mm. uh, and the fact that the uh, creation of the, uh, of the uh, Indian residential schools was, uh, created under the uh, Indian Act, which is uh, a legislation that would have been passed uh, under the Crown, uh, and which took power away from, first, uh, from indigenous people over the education of their children, and also enforced the, uh, not only the assimilation, but the attempts to uh, destroy the culture and, uh, and language. Just looking at my social media, that, that reaction is very strong among y p younger people. And, and so their uh, feelings are that, uh, yeah, she died, but she didn't do enough among younger people. Whereas older people, especially those that have passed on behind, be, before me, because I was very active in the 60s and the 70s, where some of the people that had signed the treaties were still alive, really believed in the crown. Really believed now, in the just crown. Just let me follow up quickly. When, when, you, when you convey their feelings that the queen, quote unquote, didn't do enough, didn't do enough of what? Didn't do enough to enforce the treaties. Uh, and protect them from the uh, fact that their treaties were breached. Understood. Okay. Philippe, how is the Queen's death affecting the operations, the day-to-day -day operations of both federal and provincial governments in the country? Well, effectively, in a formal sense, it isn't. Uh, once the Queen uh, passed, king Charles automatically became king. Uh, and the, there's legal continuity in government uh, across her realms, which means that Charles simply becomes the legal personality that the Queen was previously. Now, that's formally speaking, of course. Now, when we look at the fact that there's a great deal of effort that's being put into holding uh, various ceremonies and having officials attend various events, then we can see that it's going to have a short-term impact. But in terms of the long-term impact, uh, there is no change uh, in any formal oaths or, or contracts that are required or any laws. Uh, the legal personality of the Crown remains the same. And let me just uh, follow up on that because uh, obviously every cabinet minister in the province of Ontario or federally or anywhere, I guess, in the country, they swear an oath to the Queen when they're sworn in. Well, th the Queen is no longer with us. Do they need to be sworn in again? No, they don't. So for two reasons. First, uh, the, many of the oaths include references to her heirs and successors, which covers that over. But as well, it is understood that the oath, particularly in a Canadian context, and as you, your viewers may know, it was uh, the citizenship oath was challenged on a number of occasions. Uh, and the rulings indicated that what you're swearing an oath to is either the queen and her legal personality, therefore the crown and its enduring timeless legal personality, or the Canadian system overall. So there, there is no need to re retake these oaths, though uh, some parliamentarians uh, may choose to do so, and similarly some uh, cabinet ministers may choose to do so. Let me follow up, Carolyn, with you on the issue of the succession plan. Uh, we, we talked a moment ago about the fact that the lieutenant governor and the premier of today, Doug Ford, did something that would not have happened 70 years ago. How did the provinces somehow get into the act that they felt they needed to do this official succession plan, which had not previously existed? Well, I think it's just because of the significance of this moment. It's been 70 years since there has been a change in reign. And so few people can remember 1952 and King George VI. So I think that the significance of the occasion is very clear. We're never again going to see a 70-year reign of this kind. And also, it's a statement of support for the new king, uh, 
Charles III over the years, and many people have wondered if he would have the same degree of support that his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, had. And all of these statements, you know, from the provinces as well as the federal government, that although the succession is automatic, all of these uh, proclamations indicate there, there being you know, widespread support at the official level for the new king. Well, let me pick up on that issue of support, Delia, because um, certainly in the immediate days after the Queen's death, there has been a great outpouring of emotion, loyalty, warm feelings towards Her Majesty. But we know that eh, perhaps not in the too distant future, there are going to be increasing voices on the issue of whether we still want the monarchy in Canada. And I'd like your view on that. Do you think this is an opportunity for Canada to consider being a republic as opposed to a constitutional monarchy? Oh, there's a small opportunity for uh, it to be considered uh, for Canada to be a re republic. But the reality is that I don't think it's uh, going to happen. I'm of the age when uh, the re constitutional conferences took place in the 80s, and people were tired of it by the end of that, that era. And uh, it would require 100% uh, approval from uh, each of the provinces and the federal government for the, uh, for the change to be made from a constitutional monarchy to uh, a republic. I don't think we'll have that. Because I think each, uh, in each case, like it, it did occur with, uh, with Meech Lake, there would have to be a referendum. And that's a huge process. The federal government and the 10 provinces can't agree that the sky is blue to lay yes. today, <laughs> yeah. let alone agree on whether yeah. it yeah. changed fundamentally the way we govern ourselves. Y yes. Okay. But and in your heart, would you like to see the absence of the monarchy in our system of government? In my heart, uh, I look at it for, not so much from my... Uh, uh, soft heart, but my hard heart as a lawyer. Ah, okay. <laughs> because of the Constitution Act of 1982 in respect of uh, my people, the treaty uh, rights and uh, Aboriginal rights, they're entrenched in the Constitution Act of 1982, which means that in a certain way the Crown, uh, 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 King Charles, is symbolic. So whether he, he, he were no longer uh, the King of England, it would continue. Uh, the, the responsibility that Canada has a state uh, to enforce and protect uh, the Aboriginal treaty rights. The group that I am most happy about from that perspective is the Supreme Court of Canada, because after the 92 Act, this was the first time that case law started to be established that the, uh, the uh, Crown and Right of Canada had a duty to enforce and to protect treaty rights. Hmm. Understood. And so as long as the Supreme Court continues, I'm happy. You're happy then. Philippe, this may be a good opportunity to do a little uh, Monarchy Civics 101. Uh, the public obviously has an understanding that uh, monarchs attend events, they open bridges, they contribute to charitable organizations, but they also have uh, direct responsibilities as it relates to the governing of uh, certainly the United Kingdom and their representatives beyond in the Commonwealth. What do those responsibilities involve? Help us out there. Right, so let's break it apart. First, what is the crown? The crown is our concept of the state. It, uh, it's what provides sovereign authority, whether it be uh, the crown and council, which is the executive power, the crown and parliament, which is the legislative power, or the crown and the courts, which upholds uh, the, the king's peace. So even the crown itself, ultimately, uh, even if we were to try to replace it, we would have to replace it with some other concept of the state. Now, when it comes to the person that holds the office of sovereign or their representatives, uh, whether at the federal level or in the provinces, they have a number of what are called reserve powers. And these are understood to be personal prerogatives that they can exercise to uphold the Constitution or fulfill their duties. Most notably in the Canadian Constitution, the king is limited to two real powers here. The first is the appointment or dismissal of the governor general. And as you might recall from uh, Julie Payette's time as governor general, there was some discussion about whether or not the queen might have to exercise her personal prerogative to dismiss a governor general. And the second one is section 26 of the Constitution Act 1867, which has a dual key system effectively for uh, the naming of additional senators, where the queen or the king and the governor general need to sign off on that decision. Now, uh, other than that, we're talking about the, the appointing of first ministers although there's really not much discretion there left anymore. 
Uh, and the one area where there probably is some discussion, as we saw in, in BC in 2017, is the ability of vice regal representatives to decline a request to dissolve the legislatures and to invite a new government to uh, to take power. So those are really the, the limited areas. Now, I remember from school learning about the powers of reservation and disallowance, meaning that if a governor general or a lieutenant governor uh, thought that a law that had been passed by the House of Commons approved in the Senate, uh, that they didn't like it, they could refuse to sign it and in, in effect prevent that law from, from happening. Are those powers still on the books, number one? And number two, can you imagine any Queen's representative actually using those, or King's representative now, forgive me, using those powers nowadays? Well, it's interesting that you mention that, Steve, because if you look at the, the federal provision, it refers to the Queen in Council. So the Governor General would reserve or disallow on uh, on the advice of the, the Queen's Council, which at the time, in 1867, would have referred to the British Cabinet. So even though it's still in the books, it seems unlikely that the British Cabinet would uh, uh, ask the Governor General to either reserve or disallow a Canadian act or a Canadian bill, as it were. Federally, it gets a little bit more complicated because you might make the argument, and I I do know some people who would say, look, uh, the federal government should still have the ability to reserve or disallow provincial legislation, which is deeply offensive to the Constitution. My own view uh, is that it's probably a spent power, and it would be a crisis if that ever occurred. And by the same token, uh, left governors in the past have seemed to exercise these powers of their own volition, <laughs> uh, which is highly problematic. And finally, just to end, there has been some talk uh, of whether or not they can deny royal assent, so leaving aside a reservation and disallowance. Can they simply refuse to sign a bill uh, of their own accord? Uh, and that, I would argue, is uh, only for the most extreme of circumstances and should never be discussed as uh, a reserve power that would be used lightly. Understood. Let's, uh, you know what, Sheldon, middle of page two, let's bring up this graphic here because I would, um, let's share some polling numbers here. What kind of a task does King Charles III have ahead for him? Because uh, Angus Reid did a survey, this was back in April, mind you. Now, five months ago, 51% of Canadians surveyed said the country should not remain a monarchy. The survey found that while 55% of Canadians supported remaining a constitutional monarchy for as long as the Queen is alive, support for Charles and Camilla dropped to 34%. So this is the task at hand, uh, Carolyn, for the new monarch. He needs to, I guess, establish in the public's mind mm -hmm. uh, that he can do the job. Yes, right now there's a big outpouring of sympathy because King Charles III has just lost his mother. He lost his father, Prince Philip, the Duke of Edinburgh last year. So we're seeing the cheering crowds outside of Buckingham Palace, expressions of sympathy from around the world. But once he settles into the job, there's going to be a lot of critical scrutiny. And it's a similar moment in some ways to 1901 when Queen Victoria passed away. And many people simply could not imagine Imagine her son, Edward VII, who was 59, and that seemed like a great age at that time, stepping into that role. And he managed to exceed expectations and carved out a role for himself as a diplomat on the European stage. And the new King Charles III has emphasized that he wants to be everyone's king. The Commonwealth realms, the nations within the United Kingdom, the overseas territories, people of all faiths, all walks of life. And he's emphasized from day one, making himself visible, greeting the crowds immediately, uh, there being cameras there uh, for the accession council in his first meeting uh, with British Prime Minister Liz Truss. So we're seeing this very strong emphasis on making the crown, the monarchy, and these royal duties accessible uh, to the public from very early on. But Delia, I mean, clearly these numbers show, and admittedly these numbers are before the Queen's death, but these numbers show that uh, King Charles III has a job ahead of him if he intends to get more of the public uh, to embrace his monarchy. Would you agree with that interpretation? I certainly agree with that interpretation that he needs to do more. And uh, one of the things that I've been upset about uh, is the fact that uh, uh, the treatment, uh, particularly by the media of uh, the Duchess of Sussex, Sussex uh, Meghan Markle, because from my perspective as a woman of color, I thought that would bring diversity and inclusion 
uh, into the monarchy. Uh, for those of us who are not uh, Anglo-Saxon, who don't have a history from that, uh, uh, we somehow feel, in a way, excluded. And the fact that she was included, a woman of mm -hmm. color, a woman uh, biracial, uh, and just not being treated so well. I would feel that the uh, prince would learn uh, more about reconciliation, that forgiveness is important if he feels that uh, she hurt uh, them in any way because she would be so important to the crown. For people like me to have a greater respect of, of the crown. We've got just a few minutes left here, and let's see if we can touch on a couple of more things. Carolyn, we keep hearing the new king saying he wants a slimmed down royal family. What does that mean? Yes, when the queen succeeded to the throne in 1952, she brought in her extended family to undertake public engagements, including independence ceremonies around the world as decolonization unfolded. The queen's cousins were involved in this process. Whereas right now we see there's seven working members of the royal family, the new king and queen consort, William and Catherine, the new prince and princess of Wales, Princess Anne, and Prince Edward and Sophie, the Earl and Countess of of Wessex. So there's going to be a very heavy workload uh, for those seven members of the royal family at this time, whereas the previous reign, there was a more expansive idea of who should be brought in to uh, perform royal duties. And Philippe, the, uh, well, the royal family in some respects is a lot like most families in as much as there is dysfunction, there are feuds, there are harmed feelings. Um, Maybe unlike some other families, there are allegations, as Dealey just said, of racism. There's criticism of Britain's legacy. What do you expect from King Charles III in terms of dealing with all of that? Well, to Carolyn's point, I think he's going to make a concerted effort to try and shore up these areas of criticism. So I don't expect that Prince Andrew will be at all brought back into the fold, for instance. I expect that a lot of the criticism that surrounds uh, the king already in terms of royal finances will be dealt with by trying to rein in spending. The sovereign grant has been providing uh, the crown with greater and greater funds every year, and that's that's hard to, to justify at a time when austerity is coming in and, and inflation and the cost of living are, are making life in the UK particularly difficult. So he does have a daunting task ahead of him, not only in terms of the image of the family, but even the image of the institution. And uh, just going back to those polling numbers for a second, these, this is an institution that's wax and waned, and I wouldn't necessarily uh, assume that because the Queen uh, was incredibly popular that the institution will fare as well under Charles, particularly, as uh, was said, his conduct and his approach to the role will be uh, really carefully scrutinized. Indeed. Uh, Dealey, let me give you the last word. Um, we obviously don't know how long Charles is going to be the king, obviously not as long as his mother was the queen, but would you bet on him being a good king? Well, there's one highlight that I uh, have respect for him on his uh, work on environment and the fact that he has made some uh, very important statements uh, related to the protection of the land, the environment, the animals, uh, which is uh, sacred to indigenous people. Protecting the land is important. And I understand from one of the news story, uh, new stories that he did give the example about how uh, working with indigenous people in the context of climate change is uh, valuable. And he was there decades before most people. Yes, he so was. So that, that argues well. Yes. Wonderful. Uh, in our studio here, Carolyn Harris, Delia Q, Philip Legacy in the nation's capital. Really glad all of you could join us on TVO tonight. Many thanks. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.